So the outcomes of legalization would be 1.9 million less people arrested each year. $88 billion would be saved. Let's take a look at the economic impact. Professor Jeff Myron is a economist at Harvard, and he studied very hard this particular situation in 2008. He said the United States would save $44 billion not having to enforce these laws. $32 billion would be raised through revenue, totaling over $70 billion in 2008. So it's six years later, we're spending $88 billion a year in the war on drugs. Giving you some examples of what you can buy with $88 billion, $125 billion would insure everybody for nothing. How about free college education for everybody in the United States? Free. Got to be somebody in this room that digs that. I'm a parent of two college graduates. I dig that. Total energy independence for the United States with a shift to renewables in the next 10 years would cost $500 billion. And I want to remind you that that is what is made in one year from illegal drug sales. So does education work? If we were to educate people, does it work? In 1985, 42% of the population smoked tobacco. In 2003, it was down to 21%. If you look at the past month use of cigarettes among youths, it is in decline, not as cool as it used to be. Advocacy of legalization, it really is a vote to end discrimination. It's a vote to put the illegal drug dealers out of business. It's a vote to reduce crime, to increase public safety. It's a vote to more wisely spend criminal justice resources. It's a vote to earn revenue that's fair and widely accepted among our citizens. It's a vote that's responsible and smart, which is based on solid evidence. It's a vote that will greatly assist in keeping it out of the hands of minors because it's regulated and controlled and more difficult for minors to access. Advocating for legalization does not endorse the use of any drug, more than we currently endorse the use of alcohol or tobacco. It will not increase the use of drugs by individuals who currently have no desire to use it. One of the things that I've noticed when talking about drug policy reform, I have to have you think about this and understand that advocacy for legalization is not advocacy for use. When you talk to people that this should be a shift in paradigm, that we should legalize it, it doesn't mean it's good to use. It's not good to use. But we are in the worst possible of all scenarios. And the mission remains, create a drug-free society where nobody anywhere uses illegal drugs. That war continues. Looking at this chart, the first bar represents 18.9 million marijuana users. It's a pretty fair estimate. We're pretty sure that that's accurate. All other illicit drugs combined would be 8.9 million. If you look at this over here, this is medical marijuana patients. There are only 115,000 American citizens who have been accepted into the 20 states that have passed medical marijuana laws. That's it, 115,000. So here's the caution that I throw out to states that have passed medical marijuana laws. Okay, so you've passed a mar what, medical marijuana law. You have defined what somebody could use marijuana for. That does not take care of all of the other users in your community. And if they can't buy it from you, the government, they're going to buy it from the illegal drug dealer in your community. They're going to stay because there's a lot of money there and they're an opportunist. I totally respect that medical marijuana is valid. Science has proven this. It has many positive medicinal uses. But to just approve it for those people keeps the illegal drug dealer in business. I'm hoping I've made my point. During Prohibition, it was the women's movement, the members of the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform, who advocated that prohibition of alcohol must end. 
And when you look at this slide and you see what's written here, protect our youth. Protect our youth. Stand by prohibition. Save our children. The same challenges that we face in the drug war today were presented during alcohol prohibition. The solution was the same. Here are some of LEAP's goals. To educate the public, the media, politicians, that this current policy is the worst of all possible scenarios and that it needs to change. We want to restore the public's respect for law enforcement because it has been diminished. It's been diminished because of the corruption, because of the division, which gets further and further apart. So people who are former police officers, jailers, people that work in the court system, we join LEAP. We go and talk to people about LEAP in an effort to educate them and in an effort to get them to join us. Yes, we're a nonprofit. Yes, we can only go around the world with this message if we have money. But we don't ask people for money. We ask people for understanding. We ask people for compassion. We ask people to endorse the truth. And so I have an opportunity tonight to invite you to be a member of LEAP. Every one of you here. It costs you nothing. There's sign-ups on the back table. We've got some brochures back there. Please take a brochure. We have some CDs and we have uh, not too many uh, booklets back there on what we think it will be like after Prohibition. If you sign up to be a LEAP member, about once a month you'll get a letter through email that tells you what's happening in the drug war and what we're doing. And by all means, any time that you can donate, we deeply appreciate that. If you can't do that, have the discussion. Don't make believe like it's not a problem. Don't make believe like it's something that doesn't need our attention and doesn't need immediate action, because it does. I really appreciate all of you giving me the time that you have tonight to hear this message. My point and the point of Keene State is that we stimulate the critical thought process. That's been my goal. I hope I've achieved that. So for the next few minutes, I will field any questions that completes my presentation. You've been a great group, and I hope somehow this has been meaningful for you. Thank you very much. do we have in LEAP that are actually speakers like myself? Or, or, members or just members and supporters. I can tell you that we have 125 vetted speakers. You can't just be in law enforcement, sign up for LEAP, and be a speaker. You have to be vetted, like any reputable agency. Uh, so 125 that are vetted. We probably have, I'd say, 1,200 around the world law enforcement personnel maybe 2,000 because we've just expanded into three or four other countries. And I know, I know this only because um, two years ago I was asked to become a, an executive board member for LEAP. So these are the things that we talk about a lot. Uh, but what LEAP is very, very sincere about is, is that uh, law enforcement officials are vetted properly um, to study this. This requires a lot of study. Um, if you disagree with a point, it requires a lot of debate, and you're certainly welcome to and encouraged to have free thought as a speaker, um, but you just can't deny the evidence. If you'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, 
um, all the slides that I showed you was not from LEAP. Every one of those were from the American Journal of Medicine, it was from the Drug Enforcement Agency, it was from a law enforcement periodical or the federal government, which is available to you. If you go to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, you'll see a lot of these, these same things. I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, Dr. Brown. Yes, ma'am. The question is, do we envision a process of achieving our goal? And I hope that you're one of the people that get our guide on the back that says, after prohibition. Um, we wrote that, after prohibition, this one right here, there's a few in the back table, please get one of those. We do envision a process for how that will happen. And I, and I would like to share with you, ma'am, that I joined LEAP in 2007. And I was asked the question, um, when I was behind a podium, do I ever think that I would ever see anybody legalize marijuana in the United States in my lifetime? That's the question I was asked, in my lifetime. Since that time, two states have legalized recreational marijuana. Colorado has already, year to date, realized over $6 million in revenue to the taxpayer. Yes. I think it's going to unravel very quickly. Uruguay is the first country in the world to legalize marijuana for recreational use. The New Hampshire House of Representatives is the only House of Representatives in the United States that passed a legalization bill. It still has to go before the Senate. It still has to pass the governor. It's not expected to, but the historical significance is that the largest House of Representatives, with the widest variety of opposing views, passed this legalization bill. So that is amazing. One of the things that I, I did talk about in my presentation, if I could, would just like to steal a moment about why is every country in the world <coughs> under prohibition? And the answer is, there are three articles before the United Nations. The first is the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, which was pushed by the United States on the world. And we said, we want you to sign this treaty. If you don't sign this treaty, we will take sanctions against you. You will not be an ally. And there was a significant amount of strong arming to get the world to sign on, and they did. Then in 1971, they strengthened that convention with another convention on psychotropic substances. And then in 1988, the United Nations Convention Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances. So you see, every country in the world has signed the United Nations Treaty to endorse prohibition. But what's happening now is that these countries are starting to turn away. And they say, we're going to, Uruguay flat out said, we're, we're out of this treaty, we're not doing it. And they didn't get out of it the way they were supposed to, which is through a set of hearings and uh, having permission to leave. They just left. Uh, South America is next. Uh, I, my prediction is Bolivia will be next, and then South America, um, because they've been persecuted so heavily. And they're not getting the, the help that they think they need to to help with this issue. And they, they see everybody who, like Switzerland and Portugal, Portugal uh, turned their face on it and they said, okay, fine, uh, we'll, we'll still be a part of the treaty, but we're not putting anybody in jail for this. We're gonna educate, we're gonna, we're gonna provide these substances uh, and everything, they, and the, the citizenry were outraged. The government said they were gonna do this when the citizens were just outraged. They said, everybody in the world is gonna come here now and get wasted, and that didn't happen. Uh, use among youth has declined, uh, AIDS has declined, everything is, everything is positive about it. Uh, so I, I think, and again, I apologize for the long-winded answer, but it's gonna come unravel, state by state, country by country, at least for marijuana. And if it doesn't happen um, for the other drugs, I would submit to you that that's 18.9 fewer million people that we have to pursue which is pretty significant. So the number of people that we're pursuing goes from this to this, just with marijuana. It makes sense for all of it, but that we might not see in my lifetime.
but I think marijuana you'll see. And I think you'll see it sooner than later. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you explain the difference between the marijuana and the There are two vetted speakers, me and a police officer in Canada, and he's fighting for his job. 